bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. This is God's Word. Let's now sing as we prepare to hear God's Word proclaimed. We'll sing Psalm 141. Psalm 41 is a psalm where the psalmist actually looks at when righteous men correct him. It's a song that sings of the glory of God and also of what it looks like to live in communion. So let's sing Psalm 141. We'll sing stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 4. The text for the sermon this afternoon is the Word of God, as we have summarized and confessed it as church in the Hudward Catechism, uh, Lord's Day 30 and we will, 31, and we will be looking specifically at what we confess in question and answer 85. I'd like to just read the Lord's Day with you right now. <clears throat> so Lord's Day 31, question and answer 85. Question, how is the kingdom of heaven closed and opened by church discipline? Answer, according to the command of Christ, people who call themselves Christians but show themselves to be unchristian in doctrine or life are first repeatedly admonished in a brotherly manner. If they do not give up their errors or wickedness, they are reported to the church, that is, to the elders. 
If they do not heed also their admonitions, they are forbidden the use of the sacraments and they are excluded by the elders from the Christian congregation and by God Himself from the kingdom of Christ. They are again received as members of Christ and of the church when they promise and show real amendment. This is our confession. (coughs) Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, church discipline is this process within the church where someone who has shown himself or herself to be living in sin is, is then confronted and corrected in the hopes of bringing about repentance. Now, the challenge for us today is that this is something that is both awkward, it's also something that is strange to us. It seems to have little relevance for us today in a context where we have this this church gathering, we have this gathering of believers here in this church, and if they are being disciplined Why would they stick around? It seems like an odd thing. Why don't they just leave? Why don't we just remove them from the roles? As well, the very idea of church discipline sounds difficult. It sounds as though we are imposing our standards on people, doctrinal and practical, and we're being judgmental. We're telling them, if you don't do this, if you don't believe this, you're out. It's shunning. And on top of that, today, perhaps especially for those of you who are are younger, you're reading this and you're like, that sounds like canceling somebody. And that's really what it is. It's canceling. It seems like an ecclesiastical, biblical case for canceling, for eliminating someone from your personal life and from the life of the church. So what is church discipline? Why why is it something that's in Scripture? Why do we confess it? Why is it something that we have within or even as a church? We have what we call a church order. There's a whole process for discipline. Like, What is it? How does it... Why does God feel that this is an important part of life in the church? It's one of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It's it's connected to the doorway through which someone has access to the kingdom of heaven, to new life with Christ. And so this afternoon we're going to look more closely at this key and, and understand it a little more. It's a key that closes the kingdom of heaven, closes access to the kingdom of heaven in the hopes that, (coughs) excuse me, in the hopes that it will be opened again, that somehow the stumbling and the drifting sinner will be brought back. And so what we're going to see is that Christ commands us to lovingly use the key of church discipline to close the kingdom of heaven in the hope that it will once again open be opened, and we're to lovingly use this key, and it begins, we're going to see, first at the personal level with brotherly admonition, but then it also continues at the church level, official level with official admonition. So let's begin then with the personal. Discipline, church discipline as Scripture teaches it, as we confess it, as we we have it worked out in the practice of the life of the church, is an act of love. And so that means we need to understand what discipline is. It's an action focused on correction, on confronting sin, and bringing someone back from a dangerous path on which they have put themselves. It's about love. It's not about punishment. It's not about beating somebody up for doing something wrong. It's about doing the hard work of loving your neighbor when it's really difficult to do that. You understand what I mean by that? Like, It's easy to love somebody when it's all going great. But have you ever had it where there's somebody in your life 
who is living in such a way where it's just really difficult for you to love them, to confront them, to correct them. You know, it's easy when things are great. You can just say, you you don't have to do anything. It's low maintenance. But when sin enters into the equation, when sin comes there, what do you do? It's easy to just ignore them. It's easy to just remove them off your, your friend list, so to speak. It, it's easy to leave that responsibility to somebody else. Well, hey, they're messing up their life. Well, I hope they got people that care about them because I don't. So discipline begins at a personal level and it's about the hard work of loving somebody in a difficult situation. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 18. <coughs> what he says there in verse 15, you know, if your brother or your sister sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Literally, you have spared your brother. There's a sense in which he has been going towards something that's going to do him harm, but you have spared him from that because of your personal interaction with him. Confront the sin personally with someone in your life. And then even when he doesn't listen, it's not like it's a one and done thing. Jesus continues, verse 16, if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that everything, every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. In other words, if he doesn't listen to you, keep trying. Keep working on it. It could be that you've just got something in your head and you're kind of messed up on it. Maybe you've got the problem. But if he sins, bring somebody else with you and continue to interact with the brother. And the hope is that it be resolved there. The Spirit works among the people of God. It works through friendships. We see the first... We see that it's also something that begins at a personal level when we look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul's actually addressing the whole church. He's not just talking to the leadership. You know, we read it earlier. He's reprimanding the church because what happened is there was a man there who was sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother. And in some way or form, the church as a whole had a certain arrogance about it, a pride. Like, look how cool we are with, you know, we're not into that kind of sin. You know, we don't, we don't, we're so above all of that, we don't get into that. They were so spiritually that, spiritual that there was nothing that could be sinful for them. A sort of extreme and theologically justified tolerance of anything and everything. So they were actually proud, Paul calls them puffed up in the way in which they responded to this situation. Their enlightened theology. It's it's fascinating. Paul's actually as troubled by the sin of this man as he is by the response of the church to the sin. Brothers and sisters in Christ, You can lovingly exercise church discipline in your personal lives when you see sin in the words and actions of your fellow believers. It's the difficult work of loving in difficult situations. It's not easy. It's painful. It's hard. But you you might see somebody who is who is doing something that's wrong, unhealthy or unhelpful to their growth or to the growth of those around them or to the the body of Christ. You might see the way they speak or the way they treat other people. You might see them engaged in certain types of activities and you're you're like, that is not good. I, I need to talk. And it means that you have to do that difficult work of loving somebody 
in a way that they're not going to welcome necessarily. And and it's also something that we need to think about because there's two things going on here. One is how we live out that love in confronting sin, but the other is how we receive it. Because how do you receive love in the difficult situations? You know, if somebody comes up to you and asks you about what you're doing or questions your activity, how do you view that? Do you view it as an act of judgment, a personal attack? Sometimes it might be. But are you open to the idea that it is possible for people to love you in the difficult situations by asking you questions that get to your heart? And it's important for us to think about how we receive it because that also will help us in how we give that love. So I want to spend a little time drilling down on that. If if we interact with some, if if we have somebody come up to us and confront us on something that we're doing, do we think less of them because of that? And would we think more of them if they did not care? Because what you're doing in that situation is you are confusing indifference with love. That somebody that leaves me alone, somebody who does not interact with me when I'm sinning, that's a good friend. You know what? They just let me be. They don't try to change me. They take me as I am. That's the kind of friend I want. No judgment. No trying to change me. Woe to us if those are the only friends we have. Because what you have then is somebody who doesn't care enough about you to confront you when you're doing something that is not good for you and which is not pleasing to God and which will affect your relationship with God and your ultimate destination, your eternal destination. Somebody who loves you enough to get into the awkwardness and the conflict of loving you in a difficult place. If somebody doesn't do that, and I think this is important for us to get our minds around, again, looking at this in terms of receiving it, what it means for us to receive this kind of difficult love so that we can understand how to give that love. So, if somebody does not expect you to be correctable, if somebody doesn't think, well, so-and-so is living away this way, they're doing this, they're do- it's not healthy, but it's not worth it for me to spend time with them because it's not possible for them to change. We should be rightly offended by that. That they think so little of us that they believe there is nothing that could be said to us that would change us. There's a book that was written a number of years ago by a couple of young men. It was called Do Hard Things. It was probably 15 years ago or so, but... In the book, one of the lines from the authors, it was, it was written to kids. It was like, you know, young people, it was like, if your parents don't ask you to clean your room, you should be offended. Because that means they don't think you will and that you can't. In other words, if people don't expect you to be able to do hard things, that, that's not an act of love or some sort of gracious response on their part. No, it's them saying, My my child's not able to clean their room. My child's not able to make their own bed. So I won't ask them. And the point of this book is, do hard things and be offended when people don't think that you can do hard things. And so bringing it back to us in terms of how we receive love in difficult situations from people, be offended when people don't love you 
in the difficult moments where they exercise indifference or they wash their hands of you and be honored when you have friends that love you so much they're able to say things to you that will make your relationship awkward and difficult. Because they're living out love in the difficult times. And now we'll come back to how we give that love. Because there is a danger that when we give that love, we do so in self-righteousness, and we do that only identifying the person in terms of their sin. I think that's a challenge that we sometimes have with confronting sin. The only time somebody interacts with you is to tell you what you've messed up. Or when you have it, where you find out that somebody's living in sin, and you're like, can you show me a picture of that person? I don't know who they are. I need to talk to them about their sin. This is love lived out in relationship, walking the path of love and life with somebody. It's something where you exercise this love in difficult times in relationship with another person. Your brother and sister in Christ, someone in your family, and you care about them and you see them harming themselves, you see them harming others, going down a path that will bring them hurt and harm, and you want to talk to them and you do so in relationship, in love for them. And it's important to also check ourselves. Sometimes we will get pretty fired up about what we think. And we'll confront sin in such a way that we're just trying to make somebody look like us. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about somebody who is not loving God, not loving their neighbor, not loving themselves as they ought. And with a view to God's glory, to His holiness, to the holiness of the church, and to, for the, the well-being of that person to interact with them. That's the kind of love that we give. And it's love that's given in the genuine hope not to To say, I won. I let them know how much they've messed up. But love that's given in the hope of somebody truly changing. That's love. And that's love in the difficult places. God works there. And through you, loving in this difficult moment, He may be at work sparing, saving one of the lost sheep. Think about that. That church discipline, this act of loving in the difficult times and places, in those moments God saves the wandering lost sheep through our loving in those moments. And so the use of this key begins, it's lovingly applied. And it begins at the level of real love for our brothers and sisters in Christ at a personal level. But it doesn't end there. And that's the second thing we've got to look at. The loving use of this key continues with official admonition. The highest form of discipline is not personal. It's not at the personal level. Which is interesting because today it kind of is, isn't it? Like what's the highest way of excluding somebody today? You remove them from your friend list. You unfollow them. You unfriend them. You wash your hands of them. I have canceled them. They are no longer in my life. I will not tolerate them because I don't like what they've said. But when you look at church discipline, when you look at how Scripture teaches us about this, the use of this key of the kingdom, it does not end with the personal 
It is about the glory of God, the holiness of the church, the holiness of the church in terms of it being set aside to God, and the holiness of the church in sense of being pure, clean from sin, that the church is a place where sin does not feel at home. That people who say hateful things, offensive things, they do not feel at home here. The holiness of the church is in view. And then finally, the eternal destination of the person is in view. So when you think about this loving use of the key, it continues with this official admonition. At a certain point, the only way to do the difficult work of loving in difficult and tough times is to involve the church, to involve the leaders, the elders of the church. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 18. That's what Paul's talking about. 1 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> what Jesus says in, in Matthew 18, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to, to them, so that's to, to you and, and then also to, to some other people that you have brought along with you in the second stage of interacting, of loving in that difficult situation, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I tell you the truth. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound on heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You have the official use of the key of the kingdom called church discipline by the elders. Admonition at the personal and the social level gives way to admonition at the level of office, of leadership of the church. The elders as representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ now confront the person and their sin. And they say the sin has to go. It cannot stay. And either the sin goes, or if you refuse to leave the sin, you must go. It's official. Christ's representatives, leaders of the church, and the Spirit of God working through the offices of the elder, office of the elder, God works through them, and there is hands in His voice on earth. What they say, what they do is heard in heaven. What heaven decides is exercised here on earth by them. And they have eternal significance. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 describes that process as well. Because on the one hand, it's a personal issue. It's at a personal level. The, the members of the church at Corinth have been allowing a, a sin to go on unconfronted. And they have this arrogance, this pride about it. But then when he addresses it, he speaks to them when they are gathered together. Verse 4 and 5 of 1 Corinthians 5. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So within the context of worshiping as the people of God. And then, this is difficult to get our minds around, we won't spend too much time on it, and, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. We're just going to focus especially on that handing over to Satan what does that even mean? The sense is not that Satan somehow is going to do the difficult work of Christ. That the difficult work of loving is now going to be done by Satan. But what Paul is saying is that there is this sense in which there is this in time, this temporal condemnation 
as opposed to the eternal, where they are exposed to sin and to Satan. Where they are exposed to life outside of the people of God, of the church. Where they are exposed to the destination the path they have chosen to walk will lead. You have chosen a path that leads to separation from God, to the place where Satan reigns. And in this act of discipline at the official level, the elders of the church, in a sense, take the person and they say, you are no longer part of this and we leave you now in the realm of Satan where you will now see what that looks like. And the hope is that it will destroy that sinful desire in you because you will see this is what it really is and this is where it leads. It's a difficult thing to do. But the hope is that this temporal, this condemnation, this being exposed to Satan in time will save the sinner from eternal condemnation. And it's likely when you look at 2 Corinthians that the man who was exposed to Satan did repent. But... And there are times, perhaps, you have had those stories. I've been able to see them where people are disciplined and their hearts are exposed. God, by His Spirit, convicts in a way that our pity and our being nice could never do. Because they receive a foretaste of the destination connected to the path they are on. That is the hope that the door is closed that they might return. And so it is a difficult way to love. It's loving in the difficult times and places. It's love in the trenches. And what's magnificent about it is that it's not just personal. Like, think about that. If it was only personal, that that the highest recourse you had was to unfriend them. That the ultimate judgment was your removal of your love. And that somehow that removal and exposure to a world without your love would somehow crush them. (laughs) Which is an act of arrogance on our part. Do you ever think about that? Like, that the ultimate punishment that you can inflict on somebody is unfriending them? (laughs) That there's a world of people going, oh, Tony's not a friend of me anymore. My life is meaningless. I have been exposed. My flesh is destroyed. (laughs) That's a joke. That would never, I don't think that ever happens. But for them to know that this, this act of loving in the difficult times and places is not just personal, but that the church, the official church of Jesus Christ is engaged and Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, is engaged in the process. And that it has official sanction from Him that it is no longer about how effective you are and about how important you are to the person but it is about the objective reality of who Jesus Christ is and His confronting the sin. And it's left with Him, the one who can raise the dead. Think of the hope that you can have when you love somebody in the difficult places. Maybe you're here right now, you've got somebody in your life, somebody who has drifted from God, perhaps a child, perhaps a grandchild, where they are so far 
Or maybe you're a grandparent, you get together and, you, and you're thinking, the only way I'm going to bring somebody back is if I tell them and remind them that they should come to church again. And the only time, <laughs> every time your grandchild or your child sees you, they know they're going to get the speech. Yeah, why are you not at church? You should go to church. I won't talk to you, I won't, unless we talk about this. If it was left at that level, that's discouraging. But if it's left at the level of knowing that it belongs to Jesus Christ and that He, through His officers in the church, has closed the door to the kingdom of heaven in the hope that it would be open again, you know it rests with Him, not with you. And so that your act of of personally using the key of the kingdom called church discipline is done in connection with a larger process that involves the king of heaven. That you have a template, a pattern for loving in difficult times that is connected to the power of heaven. That means that your love is part of something bigger than you. And that's a magnificent thing to think of. You know, today we live in a, in a day and an age where it's difficult. It's difficult to love and to love in difficult times. I mean, think about it with disagreements. We just think about what's been going on over the last week. Disagreements over how we should be responding to the government. How we should be responding to protests about the government. How do we interact with people who disagree with us? How do we love when it's not easy to love? Jesus shows you how doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it means that in those difficult times, you walk alongside somebody. You don't lob bombs from a distance. You walk with people. You interact with people. You love them, and you confront and you correct in relationship, and it doesn't end there. If someone is truly sinning in a way that you believe that their eternal salvation is at stake, you have the obligation to not let it end there. You have a process, a pattern laid out to involve Jesus Christ Himself in the conversation. We live in a time where everybody seems to do what's right in their own eyes, have their own understanding of how to love and to respond to things. And what God gives us in this key of the kingdom is a way of loving in difficult times where He is brought in, where He works by His Spirit through you and through the church. And so let us live and love, and receive this love to the glory of God and for the upbuilding of our neighbor. Amen. Let's now respond to the proclamation of the gospel by singing, and we'll sing hymn 81. Hymn 81.